In order to deliver great services, you must work in a cross-functional manner. But the reality is that most organizations are still organized in departments slash silos. In this episode, you'll learn how you can use customer insights as a way to create a shared and common language within the organization to bridge those gaps between the different departments. If you're interested in that, stick around because here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hi, I'm Emma and this is the Service Design Show. Hi, I'm Mark and welcome to the Service Design Show. This show is all about helping you to design organizations that put people at the heart of their business. The guest in this episode is someone that I've actually worked with in the past. She's had different roles within agencies and now is a service designer at H&M. Her name is Emma Lawrence. So the reason why I'm so excited to share this chat with Emma with you is that she brings the agency perspective, but also the in-house service designer perspective. And those things mean different things, bring different challenges, and also allow you for different ways to design great services. If this is your first time here on this channel, I would love to have you to subscribe so we can keep bringing you more videos like this. And we try to do that at least once a week. So hit that subscribe button and that bell icon to be notified when new videos are out. Now, having said that, let's jump straight into the chat with Emma. Welcome to the show, Emma. Thank you, Mark. Nice to see you again. It's been a long time. It has been a long time. Yes. For the people who don't know what our connection is, give you like, could you give like a background of where you've been and what you're doing these days? I can. Um, so I'm currently at H and M as I, I'm a service designer at H and M since a year and a half uh, ago. And then, and before that, I was um, uh, I, I lived in New York City for a couple of years doing agency work. And prior to that, I had a, a moment where I worked for Mark uh, a few months. In the um, Netherlands, yeah. Netherlands, yes. And uh, I also did some in-house at Philips. And prior to that, I was in Stockholm. So I've been on a little bit of a tour. You've seen you've seen a little bit of the world. And and yes. I think that will bring, bring an interesting perspective to our discussion in a minute. Emma, the question that I ask to all the guests on the show, what is the first time that you got in touch with service design? Oh, it's a, it's a good question. I, uh, I studied in, I am, um, for, for education, I did industrial design engineering. And so I did a, a, one of my master years I did in Milan. And I took some um, courses there in system design and stuff like that. And I really started to think that that was, a better fit for me, mm-hmm. contextual um, uh, design thinking, and I started digging into those methods. Mm-hmm. And then I applied for um, to to do a math master thesis, um, uh, my master thesis uh, at the service design studio in Stockholm, and that was quite rare at that time, at mm. 2010. So we found one that was a kind of a pure service design agency. It's it's quite known for the audience yeah. of the show, I think. <laughs> yeah. uh, and so uh, we got to do a really interesting project in healthcare, which is good. Hmm. And that was part of it. And then I continued there for a couple of years. So. Nine, nine years ago already. Yes. Emma, you, you're bringing some uh, agency experience, some in-house experience to the table. We'll be talking about that, right? Yes. We will. All right. Uh, the classic service design show interview jazz. Are you ready? And I think so. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to pick topic number one, which is cross functional. Mm-hmm. Which question starter goes along with that one? Okay. What if we would uh, work as cross functional as the customer? moves in a, in a customer experience. Who is we? Of. Who is we? Um, I'm thinking organizations right now, like mm-hmm. any type of organization. And, and so the one thing that really has 
struck me, I think, coming from agency world, moving into in-house world, I would say is that when when you're in an agency setting, you usually have you have a you know you have a someone who's paying for this. You're in contact with one part of the organization, and it's a you know your client, and they're usually maybe from maybe some um, marketing department or business development or uh, innovation department or something like that. And and then you have those stakeholders to kind of uh, you know deal with and 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 learn and all of those things, but then. You, you always lack the rest of the organization. You never really get in contact with all of those owners of the touch points that you're actually working with. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so I think coming to uh, an organization such as H&M, I'm sure that there are many out there that feel the same, is that we have such, I mean, the customer, one of the first things I learned in service design is that, you know, we have this really nice ecosystems uh know move, drawn up where we have uh, we have the physical channels the digital ta- channels this customer service we have communication and it's all really you know it's usually illustrated in mm-hmm. a little circle mm-hmm. and then you have the customer who just moves across that circle like all over the place and it's there's no real order and and, and for the customer we're one you know it's one brand experience sure yeah but, but the way that we work when we're developing these services are anything but that it's very i would say usually very waterfall and very linear and so everyone's working in their own silos and then you do a handover to the next department who has another you know set of skills that will develop another part of the service but it's very much um i think a lot of people will will sort of recognize this yeah and the question would be like have you found some insights lessons on yeah taking so a step I, towards working in a more cross-functional way exactly and i think that you know cross, cross-functional can almost be a little bit cliche these days i mean we've used that word so so much in all the design thinking trainings and and service design trainings and we're trying to become more innovative and more um, outside in hmm. and i think that's what i've experienced here and and also prior to coming here is that when when you do an inside out project when you're actually out talking to customers and doing you know whether you're doing an evaluation of a service or if you're trying to come up with a new one or some something in between when you're talking to the customers mm-hmm. and summarizing those type of insights you always come across insights covering almost everything mm-hmm. so we'll have things that touch upon tone of voice, you'll have functional, emotional uh, insights, you'll have things that regard the, maybe the staff, um, the uh, IT, how, you know, how, sure. how yeah. things function. So, so you'll always have a really good way to, it's a, it's a good conversation starter, because there's no way that you could go around and just talk about one part with one um, with one unit or department, you'll have to gather everyone around because you realize it's an ecosystem and that you that you need to be in the same. You need to be, you know, agreeing about what are these things that we need to. So, is, yeah. well, would you say that that's the first step, like actually raising awareness and showing uh, from a customer perspective why it's needed? Is that is that still the most important thing? I think it's just very effective mm-hmm. because. If you're doing, um, let's say that you're you're you have some sort of service. We have, I mean, in my case, we're working with retail experience. So it could be store experience, could also be online, could be anything in between. But if you would go out and and interview customers or even document, mm-hmm. um, you know, filming uh, and and quoting and mm-hmm. all of that, you know, you would you would realize that all of those insights would cover everything right because right it goes in there and that becomes very strong when you're back even if you're presenting back to the core team in my case that would be something within business development then um mm-hmm. that you can't avoid also involving all of the other units because everyone kind of uh, understands um, and sometimes i <clears throat> i have a similar experience but sometimes it's also like uh, paralyzing because uh Usually you get an assignment from 
marketing or innovation and they just have a limited scope of what they can actually do so you come in with all these holistic challenges and they're like yeah but i'm i just work on the app i just work on the app like what, what's your experience with that i think that's uh i mean that's the big frustration of, about being a consultant i would say i think that's the luxury i have being in house yeah I, even though i belong to a, a certain department i can still make a case um, by inviting marketing or whomever I want to um, to discuss these things because mm -hmm. we're all under the same roof and we're kind of we're working towards the same goal, even if we have different KPIs and different s set of skills. So I think that's one of the that's one of the, uh, I think, um, powerful parts about going in house. So you have access to the um, organization in a different way. But I would say um, as an experience from uh, the agency side that we have had examples where where you you know we, we got an assignment from an innovation officer some you know sure. someone who wanted to make a digital experience for a health company or a health insurance company um, and we ended up going doing these interviews in really um, the you know the outskirts of the of the city of New York City and mm -hmm. people living in basements and you know, nowhere near need of digital innovation in these cases and so with the documentation and everything that we came with from that research we managed to flip it around and so it wasn't it wasn't about that anymore and so i guess it, it also has to do with um evidence yeah to really yeah yeah, yeah and, and going yeah. outside like i it's, it's collecting uh it's you can even challenge some assumptions about what the problem is or the briefing that you got from a client. Yeah. Let's let I, I think you're sort of already hinting upon this. So let's move into um, topic number two. And for the people who have been listening closely, it won't be a surprise. Um, customer insights. Uh, again, which question starter mm -hmm. goes along with this one? Mm, let's do this one. Mm hmm. That's your okay. favorite. How can we, of course? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how can we um, create better and more powerful value with customer insights? Okay, I'm going to ask a question again. In which sense more powerful? I would say because um, in working, again, working in this, um, you know, like I'm doing now in a huge corporation that has um, been, I think, you know, over the times very successful, but we're now, we're still successful, but we're going into a, a new era. Everyone knows that we have to, you know, everyone has to change all mm -hmm. the retail world has to rethink everything. And I think that's what powerful, I really mean, how can we create um, other sets of insights and KPIs that, uh, goes along with the business insights and KPIs that we're used to. So um, really trying to balance that um, that world that we're entering or have entered. How would you describe how customers' insights are used right now? <laughs> um, I think, so just to back up a little bit, when we're... Uh, Four years ago or five years ago, uh, the first services I started at H and M, and I, I think that um, what has really been, uh, well, you know, my team has really contributed with, is um, making customer insights um, an important currency. So, mm -hmm. with that, I mean, um, we've been providing uh, the company at a large scale, but also, um, if you think top management, that you know, type of people who are actually that, that are actually visible and also have um, power to, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. to some degree, um, and providing them and the company with insights that are actionable and understandable and tangible has been, um, I think, very effective, but also really giving them a story to tell um, as opposed to talking about, um, I guess, other types of data points are really important, but they are lacking in the story. And in this case, we've been really trying to balance that out with also talking about customers 
um, with their you know emotions and experiences and and attitudes and all of those things that really matter when it comes to it well when it comes to shopping but many other things as well and how do people respond when you present these stories these the 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 thick data i think what well i mean what we hear more and more is that um well so you can still argue argue that service design or you know customer research projects all of those things are still well you need to motivate them heavily mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. It's always like oh you know we have a lot of we have a lot of intel we uh, we don't have time right now all those things and then once you do them it's there you know people are screaming for them because obviously having customer knowledge is key it's that that's a you know knowledge is, is power in that mm-hmm, sense here mm-hmm. because you know the the customer and and i'm not saying that um qualitative insights are the only that's not the only data point but if you have that as well uh together with the story of the customer so you can uh actually build empathy around it then you're going to go much further than uh, just talking just talking about transactional data mm. or um data points from the past i think a lot of people still struggle with uh, getting clients, yeah, also in house to actually get resources in the time to do uh, yeah. qualitative research. Yeah. Again, with the question, what is your experience? Yeah, like you know that it's valuable, but how, how do you get permission to start? Yeah, so we have done. Um, so first, when my colleagues started here, they did a, a really because because of the we hadn't had any service designers, there was no customer journey map and stuff like that. So they started out with a, kind of a research project the first year and did a very basic set of tools. So customer journey, um, uh, different types of, of modes, um, like profiles and mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. all the set of insights. But I think after we can read those and um, proving how if, um, efficient and valuable those were during that time. So using them in every you know sense you can um, think of. Um, this time around, it was you know it still takes a lot of planning and management to mm-hmm. to get where you actually get to go to and do all of those interviews. But it's really it's it's really working. I think do it in do it in a smaller uh, manner first, and you have to kind of, kind of prove your way forward because you know. For anyone who works with service design, we always know that it is, um, it is quite, uh, it's slow and it's fuzzy, but it creates a tremendous amount of value. So you just you need to look at it more as a you know we'll do version one first, and mm-hmm. then next time we, we get to do more because you can always prove your yeah. Your value. So, <clears throat> so yeah, yeah and it, and I wanted to get into into details because I think that's the really interesting thing. Like when you say uh, you get to improve your way into doing bigger stuff like what kind of proof are we talking about when are mm-hmm. people convinced what, what do you show them when do they get the aha moment or when do they start questioning for more what has happened i think um i mean it's a good question I think we work a lot with documentation just in general i think we've proven many times where it seems as if things are going great if you look at the data or if you look at um, the the kind of basic metrics mm-hmm. that are set up around a project or a product, and then um, you do a, a you know a small follow up, and you you can do filming or you can mm-hmm. you know interview mm-hmm. staff. You do a, just a, a kind of a random sample, and you pretty fast can you know uh, motivate that there's something there's something off here, and it might be that some of the internal processes are not working. Um, uh, it might be that attitudes doesn't shine through in in our data. Mm-hmm. So, um, and also what it does with, uh, you know, how a, a happy customer talks to her friends versus a, an unhappy customer. So, um, I think for our in in my experience here at least, you know, working with such a big set of stakeholders, uh, I would say that um, you know. The documentation, together with uh, um, uh, you know, uh, actionable kind of insights, is always the yeah 
Yeah. So the the proof part is really about uh, finding um, insights from research where you can actually base decision upon decisions upon and where decisions have been made based upon because you learned something through five interviews and that you can sort of track that down. Is that is that the kind of proof that you're talking about? Yeah, and I think you know most of the people working with a product um, in, in a non services way or you know a traditional uh, role are rarely in contact with the actual mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. setting where the, there's a big you know, distance yeah but you you might you know you might uh, have your yourself as a as a user mm -hmm. uh, you might have friends that are used it and you use their stories but uh, very rarely they have the real experience of standing and looking at someone who's mm -hmm. trying to use something. and so really trying to push for that. I think we've also had experiences where uh, things, w you know, it, like we wanted to test something and we said, let's just uh, put a pilot in, in one of the in one of the stores. And then it, we ended up testing it before and it, it, it didn't work at all. So I think also just trying to push for just small amount of interviews, testing, and just uh, making sure that, um, you know, the basics, are covered, but I think really not being afraid of being out there and 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 creating those type of uh, uh, I don't know infrastructure to to reach out to the customers and or even just you know observe hmm. because there's so much uh, in reality and I think it, it uh, as a service designer you're so used to it uh, working closely with the customer and um, most of the people who are in a, in an office setting are not so it, anything becomes very Helpful, I would say. <laughs> uh, talking about the people who don't get to interact with um, with the customer on a daily basis, I'm sure there must be, uh, and this is uh, uh, a bridge towards uh, topic number three. I must be. Uh, yeah. There must be a challenge in uh, creating a common language between how we we slash the service design community talks about the things we do versus how people actually perceive the things what we do. So my question would be, what is your question around common language? Let's see. Yeah, I think I will go with a simple why. Mm -hmm. Why? Why should we try to aim for a common language? So between who and who? So I think one of the things that uh, that you also realize after many years of trying to sell service design is that there are many or, and, and design thinking and all of those type of methods and uh, approaches and mindsets mm -hmm. that it is quite difficult for, for a person who's not involved to understand what, what they're going to get out of it, mm -hmm. what it brings, but also um, why this method uh, or approach or mindset is, is so important. And so why the journey also is, you know, and so, I think working again, coming back to, to the setting I am in here, I think that's creating or at least aiming to create a common, a common ground and a common language has mm -hmm. been super. Important. And I think that was the first, uh, the first step that was took that, that my team took was creating that first project, which was so important because it laid the foundation of talk, even talking about a customer journey or, um, different types of customer um, that customer moves in and out of different type of modes mm -hmm, instead of mm -hmm. just traditional segmentation. And so trying to use those very simple tools um, and, and not so much to demonstrate, you know, what service design is, but giving the, giving the, the, I mean, the colleagues in our office and, and, um, and uh, anyone working within H and M, just giving them a tool that they can use in there. So even if you're not out to do any type of concept development, you can still look at the customer journey and say, where are we in this process? And yeah. what are we doing great? Yeah, so, so just yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Try to a common, like trying for everyone to have a common view on what are the, you know, what's, what's the state that we are dealing with right now mm. and, and apply your own. Yeah, um, and and the, the 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 interesting thing that has come up quite a lot is there's 
there's basically just one thing within every business slash organization which uh, people can agree upon, and that is the customer we're serving. Like that is that is the common thing. Everybody do is doing something for the customer, for the patient, for the student, for the citizen. Like right. So th that's the that's the most logical thing to uh, yeah. gather around and and create that shared language around, right? And I think also important uh, aspect of this is really because we have so many so many people within this company and and you know traditional organizations that work with different types of data points and insights and analytics and customer profiles and I mean it's a, it's a whole academy uh, I would say but we all have our different approaches and I think what's really uh, service design and design thinking does to create that common ground mm -hmm. is really. Um, also visualizing and making it tangible. So instead of um, working with, I don't know what the alternative would be, an Excel file or something like that, you would actually create um, something for everyone to look at so that we know that we're talking about the same thing. Yeah. It could be visualize um, a, a vision with images instead of, of words because of, you know, that you, you have different, con you have different, um, uh, references to you know different um, to different uh, descriptions. So really trying to bring it into the tangible visual um, uh, manner, I think, has really helped because it does it does also take it down one level. So that you can look at it and say, okay, so I can I can take this and I can pair it up with my knowledge, and they're not in conflict. Hmm. So if you, yeah, if you if you think about common language and uh, look at your learnings from uh, the past uh, eighteen months, what is like the if you could start all over again uh, regarding creating common language? What what would you do sooner? What what would you do different? Uh, that's a good question. I would Thank probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think I just. I think for my sake, I would have used our uh, our customer journey even more. So as uh, you know, as of, I use it in my own work, but mm -hmm, more mm -hmm. towards the rest of the organization, because obviously you also um, you learn by seeing it, uh, by seeing other use it. And so stuff like that, you know, leading by example, I think that's a, a, a good reminder. That you can, you know. And and why the customer journey map is that is that specifically a document where people have a strong response to? Um, yeah, I think it's been good because also because it's simple enough for anyone mm -hmm. to place themselves or their uh, part of the organization in. So if you're working with whatever you're working with, um, if you're in a store environment or if it's mm -hmm. marketing, mm -hmm. like, you can always uh, attach yourself where your areas are to mm -hmm. the customer. Mm -hmm. and um, probably I would have, you know, pushed it even further because I think it's, um, uh, it's a really valuable tool. And, and as we talk about a lot, a lot in the service design world, it's not a really a deliverable, it's really a tool. So exactly. It's a means to an end. And then <clears throat> for the people who are watching, then most of them probably know that I'm big on journey mapping. Uh, so if people, I'll link to a few journey mapping resources, uh, in the show notes, Emma, um, as all the other guests, I, I want to give you the opportunity to ask us, the listeners and viewers of the Service Design Show, a question. Is there anything that we can think about? Is there something, a question on your mind? <laughs> yes. Let me think. So, um, hmm, I, I one thing that came to mind was prototyping, because I think... Um, I working um, in different agencies and different uh, organizations, I think there's always like a different uh, culture and a different um, set of tools that mm -hmm. you know, are, people are accustomed to. And, uh, but I would, it would be interesting to, to learn a little bit more about except the traditional, you know, mock up uh, digital prototyping, what other ways there are to, um, to work with, maybe even physical environments. 
So touches. what kind of prototyping methods are people using? Yeah. Hmm. Maybe we can do a special episode on that. I have some ideas. Um, let us know down below in the comments, or if you're listening to the podcast, head over to the YouTube channel. Um, Emma, time has yeah. flown uh, by. Um, <laughs> thanks for sharing your experience with being in-house versus being in an agency. I think mm -hmm. these are the topics a lot of us can relate to. So um, the conversation isn't done yet for sure. Hope not. So getting back to Emma's question, what methods and tools do you use for prototyping? Leave a comment down below. Let us know and join the conversation over there. If you enjoyed the things we've just discussed in this episode, grab the link and share it with just one other person today who might find it interesting as well. And in that way, you'll help to grow the Service Design Show community. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next episode, which you can find over here. See you there.